your reading this morning before the message is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, reading verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Would you stand with me as we read the word of God? <laughs> Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you have communicated your character and your nature to us. And you give us many blessings, but you also give us warnings because you have called us to live in light of your character and your holiness. And we pray that as we live in the midst of a sinful age where perversity is promoted and where the, the teachings and standards of the Bible are denied and denigrated, that you would help us as your people to hear the word of the Lord and to be willing to obey it and to proclaim it and not to fear the wrath of men or the rejection of men because of the truth of your word. We ask this morning, Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear and hearts to obey that we might turn from sin and embrace the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, John. Uh, this has been a tough week for me in studying the scriptures and looking at this portion and responding to what is being called in all of Canada and now here in the United States, Conversion Sunday. Uh, my intention is to speak a bit on biblical sexual morality. Um, you know, it'd be a lot easier if we could just kind of forget it. You know, there's preachers that only preach the good stuff, <laughs> only preach the easy stuff. Um, the Bible touches on these very difficult subjects and topics. Uh, we, as John said, we live in a, a time right now when up is down and down is up and right is wrong and right is, and right is you know, evil is called good and good is called evil. There's been... Um, and I guess the best I want to just kind of open it up first and foremost, we've been preaching through the Acts of the Apostles. And the Acts of the Apostles are set off really by the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go into all the world, preach the gospel, making disciples, and lo, I am with you, teaching them to obey everything that I've taught you. Uh, it's this idea of kingdom. We see right here in the middle of this thing here that those that are such will not inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus and John the Baptist said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, as I said, that and then all of Acts of the Apostles is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ being preached, the lordship of Christ, the kingship of Christ, and it's engaging the world which is lost and fallen. The kingdom of Christ engaging, really, the kingdom of the enemy, of Satan. Uh, that, that light and darkness are clashing. That as Paul was encouraged in the Acts of the Apostles there, after he saw that vision of Christ, Jesus sent him to turn people from darkness to light, from the kingdom of Satan to the, to the kingdom of God. 
that their sins might be forgiven, that they might be cleansed and, and have an inheritance. There's a battle going on in the world now. We talked last week about the viper, that viper that came out of the fire to bite uh, uh, Paul. It's indicative of this battle that started in the garden, the temptation that led man down that wrong path. And then the, the, great, the great gospel annunciation that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent and he will bruise his heel. And that happened, and Jesus died and was buried and rose again and is now at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning until his enemies be made his footstool. And it says that during that time, it's a battle. It's a battle. It's a war. And what, what, what we see in, in what I want to look at today is that the enemy is active. Those that are against Christ and want to bring about immorality and death and destruction and the destruction of the family, what God had ordained in the garden and what God calls us to build up as our faith in Christ, they're looking to destroy the family. And God has an answer for that. And there should be a response from the church. The church should be those that stand wholeheartedly for the truth against evil. But so often, this very vocal minority is bringing in just terribleness. I mean, if it's even a word, to, to see what's going on in Canada, the legislation that's been passed, this C4 bill that we're going to look at, in which... Not one senator and not one MP stood against it. And I'm sure some of them are Christian. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. In our nation, there's the Equality Act. All of this is a reproach to the very God who is eternal and sovereign. It's a reproach to his image. And it is destroying people, individuals, and families. And the church is quiet so often. So today, what I, why I'm preaching on this is I'm res responding to this idea that, that, that the church needs to have a response to the evil. I see the scriptures engaging culture at every level with the gospel, calling men, women, children to repentance, to turn from their sin, and to trust in the living God. And this is wonderful. But, but in doing that, we have to call sin, sin. And we have to engage sin rightly with the gospel. Not just that, but we've got to call our legislators and leaders to repent of the evil that they're inflicting on people. And on us is a culture in America and in Canada and in many of the Western nations. The church, we see the spheres, we've talked about the spheres of influence, the, the individual, the, the family uh, the government, the church government, the state government, they all have responsibilities, but they all answer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Government was not put in action to do what it's doing. It's supposed to reward the good and punish the evil. And they're not doing that anymore. They're doing the opposite. So as I consider cultural engagement, you folks understand and know how much I value us cooperating with churches, pastors of like precious faith. I led us to, to join the Southern Baptist Convention because there's so much good there in, in missions and so on and so forth. But now I see unevenness in their response to culture, which has caused me to fellowship as we have with the Sovereign Grace Baptist Fellowship of Churches and they are uncompromising. I just got the most recent uh, messenger from Sovereign Grace. The first article is about social justice, exposing the sin that's in the world and standing up against it. Oh no, let's just talk about the gospel. Let's just talk about people getting saved. This is part of that. This is what the gospel is about, engaging evil with the truth of the gospel. That's right. So I've also seen, to, seen fit to, to fellowship with the G, G3 Fellowship of Churches. You'll maybe be familiar with the G3 conferences. John MacArthur speaks there. 
Josh Boyce is a, 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 one of the is the president of that, and there's a whole host of pastors in America, and these are churches now that are are fellowshipping together around the Baptist distinctives, the Reformed faith, and standing against the evil that's going on in this world. Churches that can be uncompromising. Uh, this whole thing that, about Conversion Sunday and, and speaking on biblical sexual morality came from Dr. Joe Boot of the Ezra Institute. And his whole ministry is one of, 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 of breaking down scripture and history so that we might apply it to all of culture. And there's so much to learn from scripture and then from cooperation together. So he has, he and the Ezra Institute has gotten all the pastors in Canada to gather together. So, so what this is about, and, and John MacArthur is where I heard about it, they just passed a bill, and maybe let me first tell you that, the bill that was passed up in Canada, <clears throat> and this was gonna be a one-part sermon, and it was really gonna be based on, for us, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 20, and that's gonna be next week. Which is going to, because here's the deal. God calls us to purity. God calls people to live pure lives. Not just Christians, but everybody is answerable to their creator to turn from these sins and to trust in him. Either they will trust or they will be judged. So it's going to be a two-part sermon. Today is going to be basically answering from scripture some of these deviant lifestyles that are difficult. So, so the idea about moral and immoral are at odds. The idea about worldly and, 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 and worldliness, uh, justice, injustice, purity, impurity, these are all themes that, that, are, that are, are inculcated within this. But let me, let me just mention the, the, what has passed recently up in Canada. And the Canadian pastors, Ezra Institute and the others, ask this, our, our Canadian pastors have called on pastors in America to preach a sermon about biblical sexual morality in response to the recently enacted Bill C-4 into law of the land. And this is going to be something they're looking to do every year in response. It came, it was passed and came into law this week, I believe on the 8th of January. So they're calling for a response from the church. Why would we bother? Well, why we would bother is the only place that a real response can come to this kind of evil is from pastors and from churches and from church people. We've got to speak up for the truth. So, so uh, again, I first heard about this from Pastor John MacArthur. We all know about Pastor MacArthur. He's been quick to respond to the government overreaches in shutting down his church and in, 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 in just totally getting inside the church. Now, this here is not just getting inside intruding through government into the church, but they're intruding into the family. And, and I'll, I'll read a little bit about it, but trying to tell parents how they need to raise their children or not raise their children. And it's just so evil. But John MacArthur was quick again to respond to this call from the pastors in Canada to encourage pastors here in America to do the right thing. He said, I am eager to support our Canadian brothers and to preach on biblical sexual morality on January 16th. And I invite you as a faithful pastor to do the same. Our united stand will put the Canadian and U.S. governments on notice that they have attacked the word of God. We are all well aware of the evil power and destructive influence of the homosexual and transgender ideology. Our government is bent on not normalizing this perversion. Our government is bent on not only normalizing this perversion, but also legalizing it and furthermore criminalizing opposition to it. That means all of us. I'm a grandfather right now, and it means my grandchildren. You as parents of young families, it means you all that are trying to raise, they're trying to to come in and it's just bad. But, but this is in essence what the bill sees. See, it's not just that they want to just do, it started out, we just want to do our own thing. We just want to live our own lives. If we want to, 
to live these aberrant lifestyles, and I'll try, I know there's young people, if we want to live like that, we just want the right to do that. We won't bother you, but don't bother us. It's gone. This radical, small group has gone way beyond that to where they're trying to say it's the only right way and you're not allowed to tell them the gospel. And, and, and that's just not right. So what this bill is, it's causing persons, they call it con conversion therapy. Whereas conversion therapy causes harm to the persons who are subjected to it. Just conversion therapy is the conversion we all experienced in faith in Christ, in turning from our sin and trusting the living God. That's the conversion therapy that they're outlawing in Bill C-4. Whereas conversion therapy, they say, harms the persons who are subjected to it. Whereas conversion therapy causes harm to society because among other things, listen to this, it is based on and propagates myths and stereotypes about sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, including the myth that heterosexuality, cisgender identity, that's just their terrible name for being a boy and a girl, and being a born, born and a doc say, this is a boy, this is a girl, and, and they're calling it assigned at birth. It's not assigned at birth. It's assigned when they were conceived in their mother's womb, who God created wonderfully in that mom's womb, to be a boy or to be a girl. They call it a myth. Heterosexuality, cisgender identity, and gender expression that, ex that conforms to the sex assigned to a person at birth are to be preferred over other sexual orientations, gender identities, and gender expressions. So they're saying it's harmful to say those things that God has ordained from the creation of the earth when he created men and women are harmful now for someone who wants to, to completely rebel against God in all those other ways. And then they go further to say, and whereas in light of those harms, it is important to discourage and denounce the provision of conversion therapy in order to protect the human dignity and equality of all Canadians. It does the absolute opposite of what supposedly it does for those folks. So the definition of conversion therapy is the idea or practice of any type of treatment. That's what we're doing this morning. We're practicing conversion therapy treatment this morning as a pastor as I preach the good news of Christ and say turn from sin and trust in Christ. This is what is outlawed in Canada. In sections 320, conversion therapy means a practice, treatment, or service designed to change a person's sexual orientation to heterosexual, change a person's gender identity to cisgender, change a person's gender expression so that it conforms to the sex assigned to the person at birth, repress or reduce non-heterosexual attraction or sexual behavior, repress a person's non-cisgender, repress a, or reduce a person's gender expression, and then listen to this point here, for greater clarity, so, so what's outlawed is you can't preach the truth of the gospel. You can't preach that you are a boy and a girl. You can't preach that, that getting married and having children is the right way to go. You're not allowed to preach that to someone who is confused, to someone who may be confused about gender, about their attraction to whomever. They go, then they go farther. For greater certainty, this definition does not include a practice, treatment, or service that relates to the exploration or development of an integrated personal identity, such as a practice, treatment, or service that relates to a person's gender transition, and that is not based on an assumption that a particular sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression is to be preferred. So what it says is, you can't preach the truth, but if you're confused, if you think you might be a boy when you're a girl, or you think you might be a girl when you're a boy, they're more than welcome to tell you about that and to encourage you to move in that direction. Not only just to move in that direction, but to take surgical measures 
to bring that about. Kids, underage, still in mom and dad's home, if they were to get confused, they can you do a, teach them that all you want, but conversion therapy, to say, listen, you don't have to be confused. God created you this way. That is sin, and you need to repent of it. You can get thrown in jail for up to five years in Canada. And here in the United States, the, the law that they try to pass, which is similar, is the Equality Act. So what I want to do in responding to this is as a pastor, in cooperation with all these other pastors, I want to expose as well this sin to us. We need to know, maybe some of you folks don't even know this is going on. Maybe we're just living and we, we don't even realize. But we need to realize so that we can respond to this in a godly manner with the power of the gospel and love. So that I can tell you, these folks that need the gospel, we need to preach the gospel to them. Right? They need it more than ever. And here it is right in the middle of our text. So that is now the law in Canada. So now a mother or a father who offers their children freedom from sexual sin through repentance and faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the very text that John just read, could be threatened with five years in jail. The very words of the Bible in Canada are now outlawed. They are simply myth. Myth. They will either repent or come to judgment. Because I got news for you, they answer to the living God. They don't get away with this. These legislators, every one of them that voted unanimously to support this, are under the judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they will answer to him. They will either repent or they will be judged. Every one of those senators and members of parliament unanimously voting. So today I'm still free here in the United States of America to preach this sermon that many of my brothers in Canada stand in danger of being imprisoned. Listen, if they were willing to send them to prison because they gathered to, pre to, to sing and worship, I suspect they won't stop short in this measure. Martin Luther says this, If I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at the moment attacking, I'm not confessing Christ however boldly I may be professing Christ. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved, and to be steady on all the battlefields besides is merely flight and disgrace if he flinches at this point. Many times in church history, we've been considered the church militant. People don't like to hear that. The church militant means we preach the unadulterated word of God. We engage sin at every level with the gospel. We call men from every sphere to repent and bow to Christ. Amen. doesn't mean we take up bazookas and blow them off their horses. But in a way, we engage them with the sword of the word of God. That's right. And that's what we must do in this endeavor. We can't let this go without a response. No. So today I'm going to endeavor to preach this that is now outlawed in the in Canada and very well could be outlawed here in the United States at some point. But what I want to, I guess, my I think the big takeaway as we look through this, I hope this causes us to be, to feel the weight of it, to, to understand what is at stake and to be praying people and to be people that are, are, are not unaware of that are not unwilling to speak the truth and to let our legislators know such. Um, and I'll go through this a little bit, but like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm coming together with pastors that are feeling this, that are speaking up. There's a whole other group, like I said, the SBC, where there's pastors that are saying, that's, that's, not, that's a non-issue. That's political. Let's not get in those waters. We're still allowed to preach the gospel, so that's enough. But don't you understand that this is the gospel? You can't give up this part of the gospel. What, are they going to start telling me I can't tell people, can't do this or that? Listen, you can preach the gospel to people that steal, the people that murder, the people that, 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 that are angry. But, but the ones you can't talk to 
are the ones that are confused about their gender. The ones that are homosexuals, that are sodomites, those, those are off limits. Think what a shame that is if pastors and people listen to that. You've got a neighbor that's confused, that's in that sin. Buddy, I would love to tell you about Jesus, but the government says I can't tell you that, that 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says that that type of sin is going to make it so you're, you're not able to enter the kingdom of God. Not just the kingdom of God now, but eternally destroyed. That's what's at stake. The gospel's not a simple come and, and say a few words and, and live willy-nilly. Uh, it, it, it's, it's truly about engaging people that need the gospel. So I want to look at this. John brought it out there at the get-go. Warning. God puts strong warnings in the scriptures. So I want to first look at the strong warning of scripture. And then I want to look at conversion therapy applied right here in the scripture. And then next week we're going to take that next step and see what does it look like for us that maybe aren't struggling with these sins but are still called to purity. To, to, to flee sexual uh, immorality. So first of all, this strong warning. This letter to, is to the Corinthians who've, who uh, have received this conversion therapy. These folks in Corinth have 180 degrees turned opposite from sin and are, are following God. But what's really interesting about Corinth, it's very much like modern day America. They were very paganistic. They were very given to all types of sexual sin top to bottom, and they had come to faith in Christ, but some of them were still vacillating here. Can I still do it? Can I do it and still be a follower of Christ? So Paul, in no uncertain terms, is laying out to them, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, then he goes on to say, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. That's why the stakes of a bill like C4 or the Equality Act are so high. People's eternal souls are at stake. If they continue in this and people keep encouraging them and telling them it's an okay way to live, they will end up dead and eternally dead. And it's us that have the gospel of salvation that have to speak up. We see here, too, that there is a, 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 an overbalance. If you look at this little portion here, and again, because the Corinthians were so given to sexual sin, there's, he's laying it out in no uncertain terms. There's a real focus on sexuality and aberrant wrong, wrong lifestyles. Fornicators, adulterers, homosexuals, nor sodomites, all of it is idolatry. What type of idolatry? You're going to either worship one of two things. You're going to either worship God or you're going to worship the creation. These folks are gods unto themselves, and they're worshiping their own human existence and sexuality and finding their, their, their uh, um, pleasure and fulfillment out of that. Romans 1, 24 to 25 says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. They don't only just do it, but they want other people to do it. They want to say, this is good. Come on, praise me for my sin. It's nothing more than people don't want to serve the living God. They want to repress that truth and unrighteousness and live in their sin. They want people to say their sin is okay. And the world is going to do that, and so are the legislators. Not only are they going to say it's okay, but they're going to say the pastor is wrong. They're going to say the word of God is a myth, and God's created order is really the problem. Do you see how confused and messed up this is? Mm -hmm. We have got to engage it straightforwardly and clearly 
out of Scripture. Right. And we have to cooperate with other pastors that are doing that. Because right. if they do end up in jail, we need to be the ones that are there standing up, praying for them, and trying to help their families out. It could be me one day. You know, it's kind of nicer for me. All my kids are grown. You know, I, like MacArthur says, he'd just have another ministry in the jail if that happened. I don't know if I'm excited about that. I, I like being free. But I heard a pastor in Canada say, and call up Joe Boot and say, listen, is this something I have to stand for? Because I've got a young family, and I don't want to be put in jail and leave my family without a father. These are the choices that they're putting to us. So it's maybe easier for me, but my heart goes out to that young father. And there's a number of different responses to this. He might have to flee. He might have to take his young family and go somewhere where they're not putting people in jail for that. But, but this is very heavy, and it's heavy on the hearts of those who have to deal with this. But this, you cannot doubt, is a warning. It's a warning to them, and it's a warning to us that practicing this type, of immature, this type of impurity ends us up in hell. Just because our culture accepts it, does that mean we're supposed to? I ought to obey God rather than man. Come on. Right? Amen. Come on. Are we going to speak up against it, or are we going to be those that are quiet? As long as it's peaceful at my house, as long as I've still got the heat on and I go get some food, they're not coming after me. I'm okay. You know, there's this whole thing, and these, these are the two different uh, uh, responses to this. You've got the pastors that are, are just put upon because of this, that, that feel the weight of their brothers in Canada, that feel the importance of standing up and speaking for truth. Then you've got others that are, are saying, you know what, no, 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 we need to remember the 11th commandment. Thou shalt be nice. These people are confused. They really have a, 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 a psychotic problem. And, and we need to, to, to be patient with them. If I'm ever in this sin, don't worry about the psychotic problem. Come and tell me, James, you're at odds with the living God. If you continue in fornication, sodomy, you will end up in hell if you don't repent of it. And this is the very weight of it. But we live in a country that's completely being given over to it, and so many of these pastors won't stand up against it. We have got to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. We must call all men everywhere to repent and turn from their sin as described in the Word of God. That's right. It's not brain surgery, it's pretty simple. You know what, when you turn your TVs on and I see it all over, we've got to let our children know about this, do we not? You can't barely watch a modern show today without them making sure they have one gay relationship. And listen, it's not gay. Sodomy. Or it, 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 it will end up in hell. It's, it's homosexuality. It's not just an ulterior plan. You know, they just always throw it in. It, it, even if it's not going to be a big part of their story, there it is, right in your face. They just got to throw it to you. And I just started, the moment I see any of that, boom, I turn that show off. We have got to choose shows that are right. And but we've got to not be unaware that our children are on the internet, our children are watching TV, some of our children are going to school and being taught that this is normal. So we've got to be aware of what John say when we rise up, when we sit down, when we walk by the way. We need to teach our children the ways of God so that they might be prepared for this. I remember Erica telling me that, that she was on a Zoom class with Christopher, and the teacher was saying parents, families are not just composed of mom and dad, but they're composed of dad and dad. They're composed of mom and mom. They're composed sometimes of a group of people now in Canada. You can sign up to be a group. You just take on whatever family you want. It's, family is not pliable. Gender is not pliable, malleable. It's not changed. It is set in stone at creation. and right. is set in stone at our birth. Right. Gender is not neutral. 
Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Truth is not subjective, but objective. And it's God that declares what's true and what's false. That's right. It's the word of God is not not even in the least vague about any of this. It's extremely clear. So we must be extremely clear. Do not do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covets, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. In Ephesians, Paul said, For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And then he says it again, Let no one deceive you with empty words. C4 is empty words and lies. He wouldn't say, be, don't be deceived, if they weren't going to try to deceive you. That's right. But there's people, there's Christians that don't know the word of God. There's pastors that don't know rightly to tell their people, this is outward and unadulterated uh, uh, and affront to the living God who created us, male and female, right. to have families. What a shame for these people that are under this spell that they tell these boys or these girls, you were born that way. You got no choice. I get it. Or even some Christians that go, there's such a thing as gay Christians. Listen, we know that you have uh, uh, an, affi an affinity for the opposites, for the same sex. And that's just, that's how you were born. Just don't do the sin, but that's how you were born. That's not what the gospel says. No. The gospel is conversion therapy. It's to turn us from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, to allow us to completely overcome those sinful ways. Right. So it's, there's no halfway, there's an all the way. How about these poor folks? We can't give them conversion therapy. That they might never have children or a family, one of the greatest blessings that God has bestowed upon man. Then even further, that they would mutilate children. That's right. Who is really endangering people? We need to stand up and tell these folks they need to repent of their sin. They need to be arrested. That's right. Amen. Brutal. J.D. Greer says that God whispers about sexual sins, but he shouts about other sins. J.D. Greer was the former president of the Southern Baptist Convention. He's reformed. And, and there's things that J.D. Greer and I would fully agree on. But he is completely compromising at the very best, cowardly at the very worst, to speak up against this. Because you know what? When you're a pastor and you speak clearly about this, you get canceled. Maybe you get arrested. But he wants his churches filled. He wants gay Christians to come to church. He says that. A gay couple might come up and go, listen, what are you talking about? We love Jesus. Really? God whispers about sexual sins. Here, let me tell you what it sounds like. God, if you read this, and throw, I haven't gone even nearly into all the text that's there in the Bible. I could go to Leviticus all over. God shouts about sexual sin because it's a reproach to him. And it's a reproach to his image. And it's nothing more damaging for the, for the person. And God wishes that none would perish, that all would come to repentance. John MacArthur shouts about this sexual sin. He says, all sinners need conversion. But the list focuses, this text, specifically on the sexually immoral, adulterers, effeminate, and homosexuals who will not inherit the kingdom of God. Our calling as gospel ministers is to preach the truth, confront sin, and call all men to repentance and obedience to the gospel. 
The good news that achieves soul conversion and saves sinners from eternal wrath. Amen. That's how you shout about sexual sin. That's how you give a stern warning. Your child wouldn't begin to meander into the road, maybe play in the middle on the yellow line out here, and you go, hey, listen, come on back. You, you might want to come sit with us. No, you're going to scream and shout. You're going to run and grab that kid, and you're going to give him a good, thorough spanking. <laughs> We have got to speak loudly about the truth of this. So we must preach the gospel of the kingdom no matter what man says. We must truly love our neighbors and be nice to them. We must preach the very conversion therapy that will deliver a person out of darkness into light and out of the power of Satan and into the power of God. If we love them and if we want to be nice to them, Think it'd be nice just to let them die in their sin? Of course not. So let's look at this second part here, conversion therapy applied. Corinthians 6.11, here's the great news. They might have whispered through that, I bet you J.D. Kerr would shout this. But we need to shout both of it. And, you, and such were some, or, some of you, verse 11, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Hallelujah. and by the Spirit of God. Amen. Is there any sin so great that God can't deliver? Yeah. You know, maybe some of us don't struggle with that sin. Maybe that's not our sin of choice. Would we be turned off by a neighbor that's struggling with this? Or would we love them and share the gospel with them? Amen. And such were some of you. I see that in such were some of you, and I automatically think, there but for the grace of God go I. And this is why we need to be loving and caring and nice and reach out to folks that are in this desperate situation. We can see the gospel is the power of salvation for change. That's right. Jesus said, preach it in every nation. Teach them to obey everything that I've said. No, no, let's be quiet. They told us not to. They're going to teach what they need to teach. We can preach the truth about sexual purity to a world deluged with lies which led to much pain and suffering. They can be gloriously converted and delivered into a fulfilling life. They can be washed from their sins. They can be set apart for God. That sanctification there is set apart. They can be made special for God. I heard a testimony this week on John Harris's uh, podcast, and it was so powerful. It was a young man who just grew up with this same sex attraction, and his friends told him, you're obviously gay. That's just how you are. You're going to always be that way. He had a girl when he was young. He tried to take out on a date. His name is, oh, I wish I could remember his name. At any rate, I can get that for you. But um, he had a girl he asked out to, for a date. And they were just joking with him, these three mean girls. And when he went to the date, they all laughed at him and made fun and said, like any girl would ever want to date you. And so what did he start to do? He started to believe the lie. But this is just who I am, and I can't never get over it. Well, the long and the short of it is, he got over it because someone preached the truth to him. Amen. And he got saved gloriously. And he didn't get halfway transformed. And that's what his problem is, is he's involved in his ministry to people that have been delivered out of this lifestyle. And he pleads because he'd be on the front lines of getting arrested for the ministry he has to people who are being delivered. But his testimony is, I was gloriously and completely delivered from that sin. There wasn't no halfway. He now loves his wife, and he has children. That's the power of the gospel for change. That's right. This is the deal. We are, you know, like they'll say, well, you were just born that way. You were born with that sin. Can I tell you a secret? We were all born dead in Adam. Come on. <laughs> we great. all have a, a pre-ordained disposition towards sin. It just happens to be that in some folks, it's that sin. 
doesn't make that sin any worse per se, other than sexual sin is a sin against your own body. So there is some degrees there. But what I'm saying is in Adam, we're all born a certain way. We all are born with a proclivity towards sin. But, but see, God made a way in sending the second Adam, who lived a perfectly sinless life, who took on himself the form of a man, lived in every way like us, and tempted in every which way, but without sin. And now we have a new head. We have a new head of the human race, as it were. And there's a new humanity that's being delivered. We don't have to stay in those sins that hold us down. Christ can deliver us. They can be washed. They can be sanctified. They can be justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how? By being filled with the Holy Spirit. The devil hates the image of God. The devil hates the family. And if the devil could have his way, he would destroy every family. If he can destroy the family, he can destroy culture. If he can destroy the culture, he has his way. Like well, I got news for him. There's a risen Lord and Savior who is really in control. And there is a standard to be brought up. So Bill C-4 and the Equality Act here in America is actually discriminatory against the people they claim to protect. They endeavor to outlaw counseling with them and sharing with them the good news of the kingdom. The only one that's being discriminated is them. We can't share the gospel with them who need it most. And how narrow is your worldview that you can't be persuaded one way or the other? You know, it's the, the new thing here. You can't have a different opinion. It's their way or the highway. But my goodness, how, how weak are they? That they're so fearful that they won't let you talk to them, and then they're going to put you in jail if you do. But but we cannot, we cannot bow to that. This is the good news of the kingdom. You see there it says, "Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom?" Well, I got news for you. Jesus made a way, and the kingdom of God is at hand, and it's here, and people can repent and enter into it now through repentance. But there needs to be those like us who will preach the gospel. I wanted to labor on this just a bit for us to understand what the problem is. I was going to just jump right over it and jump right into the stuff that I think would more apply to us. And, and purity is so important. We'll talk more about that this week. But we've got to understand how grievous this is. We need to understand the danger that is present in it. And we need to be able to stand against it. Stand against it as pastors, stand against it as church members, stand against it as dads and moms, as grandpas and grandmas. Grandpas and grandmas, I got that right. <laughs> if we're silent, it, that thing will just keep going down that way. But you know what the good thing is about judgment? God allows judgment for two purposes. To judge and remove, or to cause to repent and turn, right? Listen, that ridiculousness is not going to stand. That, 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 that very vocal and active minority, they will not win out. That's right. Problem is, good men and women that love the Lord are silent. That's right. And we can't be silent anymore. Pastor Michael Thiessen from Canada says this, Our king and head is greatly displeased with our senators, and MPs for their sinful disregard for the spiritual and eternal well-being of Canadians. But it is important to note that they have also committed high blasphemy by referring to biblical teaching as myth in this legislation. Could you imagine telling the living God, your word is a book of lies and myths? We all must therefore tremble to consider what terrifying judgments will be visited upon our nation for this bold gesture of hatred towards the Most High God. May the Bride of Christ commit herself to mourning, fasting, and crying out in solemn prayer for forgiveness for the sins and worldliness in the Church of Canada that has led to this calamity. 
I think you can directly look at where a nations go by how the church goes. That's right. As the church is worldly and godless and given to all types of immorality, are we going to be the ones that are salt and light? How can we possibly preserve? Then, if you're, and if you're if you're not living a right life, your light actually does nothing but bring, you know, bad bad connotations on the gospel. So we must be salt. We must be pure. We must not be worldly. We must be lovers of God instead of lovers of man. We must fear God and not fear man. And we must get inside the word of God. we got to know what we believe and why we believe in it. We can't be worldly any longer. We've got to repent like this pastor calls the church in Canada to. So let's come up and sing our last song. Let's just read this admonition from Timothy. I think the reason I wanted to labor a bit over this is because it's important for us to understand the wiles of the enemy, to be able to contend for the faith once delivered. We must contend for the faith once delivered. Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that they may lead a quiet, and that we might lead. That those guys aren't going to lead a quiet and peaceable life that are legislating like that. No. They're under the severe judgment of God. I see some of what these guys are saying and doing, and some of them are in their 80s. And I go, buddy, you're going to face God for that evil wickedness you're putting upon people. We must call them to repentance, to bow the knee to Christ. But we pray for them. Why? So that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which Paul, as we know, is appointed a preacher. And so are we. We've been given the gospel of, of reconciliation to preach, and we have got to speak up. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your holiness and your goodness. We thank you for your justice, God, that you are a God that does not wink at sin, but that, Lord, you might judge the wicked. And we pray that you might bring down those that are uncompromisingly evil, that are enacting these type of legislation that is destroying people's lives that, Lord God, you might judge them. But, Father, we also pray that your mercy might be extended. If there's any of them that, are, that, are, that, that knew the right thing to do, but they were cowardly, bring them, Father, to repentance and cause them to stand for truth. Father, I pray that not just for the legislators and the government that are supposed to carry out your will and the sword rightly in Canada, but here in the United States, Father. And God, we pray for revival. Lord, help us to be those that are, are, are praying, that are repenting, that are interceding on behalf of others, Lord God. That we might uh, uh, see, Lord God, you deliver out of darkness into light, God. That even as the standard of darkness has been, been just wreaking havoc, Lord, raise up your church to be light and to be salt, Father. God, help us as we raise our children. As fathers, God, help us to be vigilant about love for you and love for your word. Help us, God, as fathers to be vigilant to train up our children rightly in every which way. Father, for dads and moms together to be able to be that incredible blessing of a family to then raise up godly seed those that the promises to them and their children help us father as grandparents as church members to stand for truth 
to stand together to see all of your good promises come to be in our church and in our families, Father. We just commit this to you, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen.